Hi, this is Chris Rossetti in San Francisco. For Conversations with Comedians, our very special guest will be the author, comedian, and college professor of fun, the amazing Tommy Moore. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time of day it is for you, and whenever you happen to be watching this broadcast, welcome in to Conversations with Comedians. My name is Chris Rossetti, free to laugh now, here in the city of San Francisco, free to laugh now because I was set free from 30 years of depression. I want to encourage anybody that's suffering from depression, stress, fear, or anxiety of any kind, don't you ever give up hope. Don't you ever give up hope. If I can be set free from depression, your miracle could be just around the corner as well. Well, thank you for joining me today here, and we're so happy to have our wonderful guest, our fantastic guest with us, the incredible Tommy Moore. In just a few minutes, we're going to be speaking with Tommy, and we're going to hear from him. But before we do, I want to play a short little clip to give you an idea of what Tommy's been up to for the last 40 years or more, actually, even beyond. So let's sit back and relax and enjoy this two-minute clip or so, and we'll learn more about our special guest before he comes on the air with us. Thanks for joining us. Once again, my name is Chris Rossetti, free to laugh now, here in the city of San Francisco. You're watching Conversations with Comedians. So there you have a little clip of our good friend, Tommy Moore, our guest today. Now, before I bring out our guest, let me just tell you a little bit about Tommy Moore. Tommy Moore isn't just a comedian. He's an author. He's written three books, best-selling books, five-star books, which are available on the internet. We'll tell you more about that a little bit later. He's also a college professor, a newspaper columnist, a comedy historian, and almost a magician. I'm going to have to ask him about that one. Almost a magician. Also, he's recorded, or rather, I'm sorry, he is holding a record of 354 appearances at Caesar 
resort hotels and casinos, as well as Bally's Grand and Golden Nugget, Harris Marina, Playboy Resorts International, Sands, Tropicana, and Trump Plaza. He's written for Mad Magazine. Oh, my goodness, Tommy, I didn't know this. Mad Magazine. And he has had an 11-year newspaper column called The Comedy Corner and written three five-star books, as I mentioned. He's performed in England, Germany, Iceland, Wales, and the Netherlands for the USO. Open for Chubby Checker, Bobby Rydell, Jay and the Americans, the Coasters, the Platters, the Dovells, the Devels, the Times, Loretta Lynn, Janie Fricky, Dion Warwick, Robert Goulet, Henny, I'm sorry, Harry Youngman, no, Henry, Henry Youngman, Soupy Sales, and Jackie Vernon. He's had his own comedy club, produced hundreds of charity fundraiser comedy yes. shows. Did I do all those things? No wonder I'm tired. Excuse me, I want to take a little nap. <laughs> okay, those quick naps. Are yeah, I did all of that stuff and more. I've been doing this. I've been I've been the comedian for 47 years, but I've been an entertainer for 60 because I started when I was nine years old doing puppet shows and magic shows. And then when I hit 20, I became a comedian. And it's funny because I started out as a strict stand up and I was good, but I wasn't having fun. And I said, why am I not having fun? Because I'm not doing the stuff I used to do. I'm not doing the magic. I'm not doing the puppets. I'm not doing the audience participation. I said, I got to get back to having fun. And the weird thing is, when I was a stand-up, I was a solid middle. The minute I went over to doing the stuff I wanted to do, I became a headliner immediately. Immediately, wow. because I was doing things that nobody else was doing. Nobody. And if you look up here in the corner, where is it up here in the corner? You see Don Rickles. Uh, Don Rickles told me once the real secret that his father told him, whatever you do in life, right up there, Don Rickles, wait, there he is, Don Rickles, where is he? He's over here. He said his father told me, whatever you do in life, be different. If you can be different, people will remember you. So many comics uh, you know, people walk away saying, oh, the first guy was funny. The second guy was funny. Uh, the last guy was uh, the last guy. Forget it. They got to remember you. They got to remember your name, which is why I want to thank you for putting my name on the screen. Because to be honest, a lot of people don't know who I am because I'm a Philadelphia comedian. Philadelphia, Atlantic City, Poconos. That's what I did for 40 years. And the people the two hours away have no idea who I am. You say, Tommy, they say, Tommy who? As a matter of fact, I was thinking of changing my name from Tommy Moore to Tommy who, because more people know me as a Tommy who than anything. Matter of fact, I'll show you. We'll do a knock, knock joke. You jump in. You ready? Knock, knock. Who's there? Tommy. Tommy who? See, what did I tell you? <laughs> so, Tommy. This this is amazing to have all these people behind you there on the wall with you. I want you to notice, Tommy. You know what's amazing for me? Being on Periscope. I was never on Periscope. I was on Zoom last week. I don't even know what Zoom is. You know, to me, Zoom, it was like a 1960s PBS show for kids with a song that once you heard it, you wouldn't leave your mind. Who wrote that song? You ever remember that song? Zoom, 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 uh, Zoom. You're going to Zoom, 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 Zoom. Who hired this guy to write that song? He wrote the same word 27 times. <laughs> zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, if Francis Scott Key had done that with the Star Spangled Banner, he could have written in three seconds. Just like flag, 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 flag. <laughs> Who wrote this song? So I was on Zoom, and now I'm on Periscope, which worries me because it brings back a lot of bad memories. Because to me, a Periscope is something in a, in a submarine, and it brings back a lot of bad memories because I was mustered out in the Navy the first night I was on a sur I was on a submarine and it wasn't my fault. I like to sleep with the window open a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. But I'm on Periscope now. This is exciting. I'm here with now. I got to tell you, I don't know how long we're going to talk or what we're going to talk about. But about a year ago, you did an interview with me over the phone, and I think it's on the internet. I know it's on YouTube. So we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff today. But if you like this, and even if you don't like this, go to uh, the one that's on YouTube, which is Conversation with Comedians, Tommy Moore and Chris Rossetti, and you'll hear me talk about a lot of different things that we're not going to talk about today. That's very but true, now, Tommy. Go ahead. No, that's very true. You were, you were my guest one year ago, 
And then uh, I spent the next year trying to get other people to come on and nobody would do it except for you. So you're, <laughs> you're the only sucker. Uh, you're the only gentleman. You're the only gentleman in the crowd. Oh, listen, I want to point something out to you and everybody else behind you on your wall of fame. Notice there's a comedian holding a monkey up there. Take a look. I don't know if you knew he's up there. Can you see the comedian holding the monkey? It's me. Right there. It's me. I made it. <laughs> I made it to your wall. <laughs> let me let me correct that right now. Let me remove no, that. Okay. I met Chris Rossetti through a mutual friend who was a comedian and a pastor, and that's Gordon Douglas. Because, because when I went to see uh, Gordon Douglas uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Gordon Douglas, by the way, he's a, as, as Tommy has mentioned, a pastor and a comedian. He's also the chaplain. Gordon Douglas is also the chaplain of the Christian Comedy Association. So I was out there on vacation and I called up Gordon Douglas and said, can I meet you? And he said, yes. I went to his house and uh, Gordon Douglas is a unique guy. He's he's raised about 30 or 40,000 children. He was voted father of the year one time or maybe twice, maybe three times. I don't know. He was voted father of the year. But all he kept talking about was Tommy Moore. He just he kept telling me, you've got to meet this guy, Tommy Moore. you got to meet Tommy Moore. And so uh, we did. We met over the internet. And now Tommy and I both loathe technology, but we're going to put up with it today. So Tommy, let's get started here. Uh, how or when or why did you become interested in the history of comedy? Well, okay. I always wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to be a comedian since I was five years old. Um, my father, who would tell stories every night at the dinner table, my father, 20 years, 25 years before that, was a theater manager in vaudeville. And he would tell me about all these old comedians. Plus, I was lucky because he would sit me in front of the TV and say, watch these guys. And I would watch the Three Stooges and Abbott Costello and Laurel and Hardy and W.C. Fields and the Marx Brothers. And I got hooked on old stool comedy. Plus the fact uh, I was raised in the 50s and the 60s. So we had great TV. We didn't have reality TV where you saw a guy fish for an hour. OK, uh, we had real TV with singers and dancers and musicians and jugglers and comedians. And they had shows like the Ed Sullivan Show and the Hollywood Palace. And they had shows during the day, like uh, Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and Steve Allen. And they would have a new comedian on every day. And I watched all of these comedians. And plus the fact, in the late 50s, there were primetime variety shows. And I watched comedians like Milton Berle and Red Skelton and Jackie Gleason and Bob Hope and Danny Thomas, the classic, classic stand-up comedians. And I just got hooked on that. And... You know, people today, young comics today tell me, because I, I taught comedy at Temple University, say, you were lucky. Uh, you know, you were around when the great old comedians were around. I said, no, you're just as lucky because you have YouTube and you can Google any comedian you want. And not only can you watch him, but you can study them. You can study them for timing and delivery and, uh, and joke construction. I said, you know, look up all these old comedians. As a matter of fact, because I see you got my, uh, if you if you want to look up a new comedian, or at least relatively new in our era, over here in the corner, no, this corner, this corner is Bobby Collins. Look up Bobby Collins' YouTubes. You will see construction. You will see rhythm. You will see timing. Uh, you will see flow like you should study. One of the great comedians and a friend of mine for 45 years, Bobby Collins, great guy, great guy. Yeah, he, his videos. he is one of he is one of the best. He's very, very, very funny, very structured, very uh, thoughtful. Um, let me ask you a question, Tommy. You mentioned speaking at a college, teaching, I'm sorry, teaching at a college. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and, and how you came upon that and, uh, you know, how long that lasted and, and what were some of the highlights of your college teaching career? I taught it. Temple University for five years. I taught five different courses, a different one every year. And uh, the reason I got that was because I was doing stress lectures for Fortune 500 companies, how to relieve stress through humor. And somebody from Temple saw me there and said, can you teach a course in stress and humor? And I taught the course in stress and humor. And it was so successful. They said, can you teach a longer course just about comedy in general? And I did. And a story about that. 
uh, the very first time I did it was the first anniversary of 9-11. And nobody realized that it would be that. And I said, maybe this is not the best day to do that. You know, and they said, well, we'll try it. You know, nobody may come, but we'll try it. And I'm walking down the hall at Temple University and I'm seeing all the rooms empty because nobody wanted to come out on the anniversary of 9-11. Matter of fact, they had signs up everywhere in case there was a bomb. Here are the, here are the exits, right? So I'm walking down the hall and there's like nobody in one room and two people in the next room and one person. But I hear at the end of the hall where my classroom would be, I hear a murmur, a buzz. And I walk in and there's like a hundred people in the classroom. They're sitting everywhere. They're sitting on the floor. They're sitting on the shelves. They're sitting in the windows. And I'm like, why did you all show up? And they said, especially on this day, we need to laugh. Wow. That must have really been a somber moment and uh, an illuminating moment for you personally. How how were you able to how were you able to muster up uh, how, in other words, could you distance yourself from your own personal uh, concerns and sorrow of that day? Or was it easy oh, for you absolutely. to? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, there was a great, there was a great old character actor who's on the original Ocean's Eleven. And his name was Akim Tamirov. And Akim Tamirov said, what do you do before you walk on the stage? You take the pill. You take the pill. Now, that has nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, okay? What you do is you take a pill and you put yourself in the right attitude to go on the stage and have fun. And the great thing is, you know, any comedian will tell you, they could be in emotional pain. They could be in physical pain. When they walk on that stage, all the pain leaves. Wow. Wow. That is so true. Now, I've just put up a little uh, comment in the comment section. We have people watching from around the country already. And I put up a little comment, and I'll run it below on the screen. Uh, you can ask Tommy your questions now. Type them in there, and we'll, we'll get to them as soon as we can. So, Tommy, let's take a second. Welcome some people in. I want to welcome uh, J.S. Scope, all the way from Chicago. Uh, he mentioned, uh, Tommy, he mentioned this guy, Ernie Kovacs. Yeah, he liked Ernie, oh, Ernie, Ernie Kovacs. Uh, do you have any Ernie Kovacs in, info? Ernie Kovacs started in Philadelphia with a little TV show on WCAU Channel 10. And every week he would go around the corner to a magic shop and he would buy props and hats for the sketches he had to do. And this is before he went national. Yeah, Ernie Kovacs, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, we have one question already from Jim, and it's, it's okay. We'll intersperse our conversation with questions, okay? So Jim asks, let me put it up on the screen. Jim asks, are there any comedians out there today who may inspire future comedians? You already mentioned uh, one comedian. Are there others, Tommy, that come to mind? Okay, yeah. Like I said, Bobby Collins. Uh, look for, uh, let's see, Rita Rudner is excellent. Um, look for... Uh, trying to think. Oh, Sebastian Maniscalco. Oh yeah, very good. Yeah. Very good. Oh yeah. Those those to me are my top three. Uh, George Wallace, very funny, very strong. I started with George Wallace upstairs at the Golden Lion Pub in New York City in like 1978, and he's still doing it. And he's one of the strongest comics you will ever see. Wow. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick. Story. Well, go ahead. Ask me a question because I, I tend to run at the mouth and you didn't get a chance to ask me anything. Go ahead. No, uh, here's what we're doing. You're the professor of fun. You're the professor of comedy. I'm the student. So when I need to say something, I'm going to raise my hand like in school. Okay. So you keep talking. Oh, I, thought, I thought that's when you want to go to the bathroom. I don't know. Okay. That's right. both hands. That's no. both hands. That's both hands for the bathroom. Okay. Uh, so, uh, oh, that reminds me of a joke. I'm a little kid. Little kid in a third third grade classroom. He's got to go to the bathroom. He raises his hand. Teacher figures she'll make him wait. She'll teach him some patience. He's there two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Finally, the teacher feels guilty. He points to the back of the room and said, Johnny, did you have your hand up a minute ago? He said, yes, teacher. She said, did you have to go to the bathroom? He said, yes, teacher. She said, well, you can go now. He said, I don't have to. 
She said, why? He said, I don't have to. She said, why? He said, I opened up my geography book. I went in the ocean. What? <laughs> See, I get a joke in my head and I got to tell it. I don't care if it's an old joke, a new joke. I got to tell it because there's nothing in there to keep it from leaving. It just it lodges in my brain. I understand. Right. Tell us about the collection. And, you know, I'll tell you about the collection. Uh, I, I had just mentioned uh, upstairs at the Golden Lion Pub in New York. I did a show there and there was somebody in the audience who they said, that's Leopold Fechner. I said, I don't know who that is. They said, that's the man who never laughs. I said, why does he never laugh? He said, he's a joke collector. He's got hundreds and hundreds of joke books and he never laughs because he heard every joke there ever was. And I said, now I have to make him laugh. And I went on stage and I made him laugh. And came back to me after and talked. And he had been a joke collector in pre-Nazi Germany. And when he saw Hitler started to burn books, he said, it's time to get my books and me out of here. And he wow. shipped his books to America. He came to America. And that inspired me. And I, I, I bought my first joke book that night in Penn Station. And I now have over 800 joke books. And I'll tell you a quick story about one of those joke books. Uh, I was going to New York. And I was doing all the showcase rooms where you find a star or whatever. And for an hour and a half going, an hour and a half coming, three hours on a train to be five minutes on stage. And I was saying, nobody will ever hear about me. Nobody will ever know I existed. Yeah, five minutes. And nobody will ever know. And I'm coming home on a train. I go in Penn Station. I buy a Larry Wilde joke book. It was the Larry Wilde Moore Italian-Irish joke book. And I get to page 100. And my name is there with a joke that I did in my act. And I said, people will know I'm alive. That's amazing. And now, so I, I bring that up to talk about Larry Wilde. Now, let me show you something. Let me grab something real quick. Larry Wilde was a great comedian uh, about... A generation and a half before me okay now the reason i did that thing about tommy who that is not my bit that's larry wild bit but i did that to pay homage to him i don't do it in my act i just do it for, i just did it for you here tonight larry wild wrote a book called the great comedians talk about comedy and in high school a friend of mine named joe colella bought me that book for christmas that book was my Bible for about two years. It was by my side. It was like attached to me uh, because it was interviews with all the great old comedians, Bob Hope, Milton Berle, Hannah Youngman, uh, Ed Wynn. If you get a chance to look for that book, The Great Comedians Talk About Comedy by Larry Wilde, look for that book. You can't find it too much on bookshelves. But it may be on eBay, it may be an Amazon, I don't know. But it's a great old book. And even because, even though the comedians are old school, there are timeless pieces of information. Now, because of that book, I really got into the theory of comedy. And because of that book, I wind up writing three books of my own. And I sent them to Larry Wilde, and he just sent me back the most beautiful note. He just said, this is the work of a lifetime. And I hope you sell a million of them. And in those books, I talked about 50 different comedians in each, in each book. And uh, these are people who I worked with or worked for or interviewed. And hand this up. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a picture of each book up one at a time. And you can tell us a little bit about each book, okay? So we'll, okay. Start, we'll start with uh, a PhD. Is this the first one? Yeah, that was the first one. Okay, tell us about this one. There it is. All right. The PhD in happiness from the great comedians. Uh, I realized that there was a lot that was similar between life on stage and life off stage. And I realized that a lot of the things that comedians told me about life on stage worked for life off stage too. So what I did is I talked to about 50 different comedians and there's advice in there about performing as well as living. There's things about frustration and anger and happiness and fulfillment, 50 different topics. And they show how life on stage and life off stage are very, very similar. So that was the first book. 
And which one was the next one? Uh, the next one was Joke Telling 101. Okay, here it is. A very here it is. different kind of book. Very different kind of book. This is a book on how to tell jokes more effectively, how to edit, how to find your rhythm, how to find uh, what jokes to put with what jokes. Uh, plus, there are about 100 jokes in there that are the comedian's favorite jokes. And there are anecdotes in there about comedians telling jokes, what worked, what didn't, why it worked, why it didn't. It's, it's about joke telling. And it's good for the amateur because you don't have to write your own stuff. You can go into a joke book and find an old joke like the one I just did about the little kid in the third grade. And once you learn how to tell a joke, it, it helps you a lot socially. Everybody loves the person who has a new joke every time. You know that some of your favorite relatives might have been the ones who always told jokes and made you happy. So the second book I wrote was about joke telling. And what was the third book? The third book was Comedians Telling Tales Out of School. I wrote a newspaper column for 11 years called Comedy Corner, and I interviewed almost every comedian in the business. And I could only write 400 words for the column. So there are a lot of stories that never, ever got printed. And this is a book of all those stories, backstage stories. Uh, funny stories, inspiring stories, crazy stories, plus stories of my own uh, that I would never tell on stage, but I would tell backstage. Here's a quick story. All right, quick story. Comedians love to tell stories about hell gigs, gigs where everything went wrong or something went wrong or, because they have more meat. They have, okay. A couple of stories. First story. Um, I get a phone call from a woman who said, I'd like you to perform for our group for New Year's Eve. Okay. She said, we can give you a hundred dollars. I said, I said a hundred dollars isn't even what I make on a Tuesday. I said, a New Year's Eve is, you know, a very high price night. And she said, well, we're a small group. I said, I appreciate that, but you know, I, I make a lot more money than that. And she said, well, we can feed you. I said, well, thank you. But, you know, she said, I make a very good potato salad. <laughs> I said, I'm sure you do, but I really, I, care. I really can't, but thanks for calling. She hung up on me. She didn't even <laughs> say goodbye. Just bam, hung up. And about six months later, I'm doing a show at Hilton. And great show, great audience. I got a standing ovation. And after the show, a woman walks up to me and says, I'm mad at you. And I thought she was kidding. I laughed. She said, no, I'm really mad at you. I said, what did I do? She said, I called you last year to work for us on New Year's Eve at my party, and you wouldn't do it. And I came here today hoping you were bad, but you were good, and I'm mad. And she turned around and walked away. You can't win. But I got to tell you, I always wondered about her potato salad. <laughs> so you never, you never got the potato salad. Never got the potato salad. You know. Spe speaking of speak story. speaking of potato salad. Wait, wait, it just made me think of another story. I wasn't going to tell this. This is a true story. True story. I did my 350th show at Caesars in the Poconos. And again, wonderful crowd, standing ovation. I walk off. A woman come up to me, little old lady with gray hair, looks up at me and said, young man. I want to tell you something. I see all these comedians on cable TV and they sing and they do impressions and they play instruments and they don't make me laugh. But tonight you made me laugh with no talent whatsoever. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got to ask you, is that the truth or a joke? I've got to know. Oh, no, that's the absolute truth. And I'm sure she meant it as a compliment. I'm sure she meant it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. But I understand that because, you know, people sometimes don't think that comedy is a talent. This is also true. When I first started and you're doing amateur nights, there was a place in Philadelphia who they actually had a sign in front of the club that said, tonight is comedy and talent night. 
Right. Like there's comedy and then there's talent and the two are mutually exclusive. <laughs> People have no idea how hard this is to do. Why? So why do you think the expression exists? Everybody's a comedian. Because everybody thinks they can do it. And because, because everybody thinks they can do it, they don't think it's anything really special until they try to do it. Well, the first time they get on stage in an open stage and they realize how difficult it is, all of a sudden they respect the talent involved Most, and the discipline and, and the work involved. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, listen, uh, people talk about a golden age of this, a golden age of that. I've even heard mention of a golden age of comedy. Is, is there such a thing? Is it too hard to pinpoint? I think there's a golden age of different kinds of comedy. There was a golden age of vaudeville comedy. There was a golden age of radio comedy. There was a golden age of silent film comedy. There was a golden age of TV comedy. Uh, and then there was the golden age of comedy club comedy. So yeah, there are a lot of golden ages. The 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 uh, comedy club era uh, seemed to wane, and but now I think it's making a comeback. It, of course, not in the light of the current pandemic, but I think the comedy clubs were making a comeback. What what is your opinion on that? Well, yeah, when we first started our comedy club, uh, nobody would come. We charged a dollar. And we couldn't get people to come. There were 11 of us comedians. And we all took the stage for five minutes apiece. And that was the end of the hour show. And a lot of nights there were 11 comedians. And there was like nobody in the audience. So what we did was we realized all 11 of us would stand outside the club in a line. Like we were customers. <laughs> and people walked by. Oh, there's a line for this place. It must be good. And we waited till there was 20, 30, 40. By the time there was 50 people, we unlocked the door, walked in. They never knew it was us. <laughs> uh, but yeah, then, then comedy was big throughout the 80s. And then what happened was cable TV uh, let people watch comedy all the time. There were, you know, 100 TV shows with, with stand-up comedy on cable TV. And people could sit home in their underwear and watch cable TV and they didn't have to shave and get dressed and go downtown and pay for parking and have a two drink minimum. So, but what they realized was it wasn't as much fun, it wasn't live. There's something like being in an audience and hearing people laugh around you. You don't hear anybody laugh on your couch, but when you hear people laugh around you, it's a catalyst. It's like being at the ball game and hearing people cheer when somebody hits a home run. It's different than watching the ball game on TV. But because of all the cable TV, a lot of people stopped coming into comedy clubs. Also, there was a time when there were three comedy clubs in Philadelphia, okay? And we all had dynamite shows. I mean, all A-level comedians. And then all of a sudden there were 22 comedy clubs. Wow. And with 22. With 22 comedy clubs in the area, maybe every show had an A comedian or maybe a B comedian or maybe a B and two Cs. And so the, the shows were watered down and people were not seeing the quality they had seen before. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I was booked to do a show at one of these you know, offshoot comedy clubs. And I walked in and I said, you know, who's on tonight? And they showed me the list. And there were six comedians on before me. And I said, the audience is going to be exhausted. And they said, no, no, it'll be fine. And I looked on the paper. And next to each comedian's name, it said five, 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 five. And I said, okay, you know, five minutes each, six minutes, only a half hour. They're not going to be tired. It's going to be fine. Then I looked next to my name and it said 300. And I knew I wasn't going to do six hours, you know. So, And that's when I realized I was making $300 and they were making $5 a piece. Because what? they were new and they were young. What? They were new, they were young. It just started Tuesday. And, you know, they only had five minutes of material and wasn't really that good. And that's what happened a little bit to comedy clubs because people saw a lot of subpar shows with a good headliner. And uh, matter of fact, 
there was one booker I worked with uh, who was adamant. He said, the first time you work with me, you have to open the show. He said, I'm a headline. First time you work with me, you have to open the show. All right. He had a lot of room, so I said, okay. So I went up and I walk on stage and I see right up front there's a table that's like eight empty chairs and one guy sitting. And I didn't say anything. Okay. Uh, all of a sudden, about two minutes into my act, I see him get up and run out. And a minute later, he brings in eight other people with him and they all sat down. <clears throat> okay. I couldn't say anything because uh, I, I don't like to be belligerent with people. I walk off stage and the club manager said, can you do 45? I said, yeah, in my sleep. He said, tomorrow night, you're the headliner. I said, okay. Now I have to go to this guy at the table after the show and say, why were you the only one at the table? And why do they all rush in? He said, we've been coming here for weeks. The first guy always sucks. But when I saw you, when I saw you were good, I ran out and I saw my friends. The first guy doesn't suck. Get in here quick. <laughs> and that's Let and me I ask you. If I, ever write, if I ever write my biography, it's going to be the first guy doesn't suck. Perfect. Perfect. Let me, let me ask you a question. Um, over the years, what are some of the most unusual uh, paychecks or payments that you can recall. In other words, has it always been money or have you, have you had to make some deals just to keep working and you got paid some crazy things? No, no, it's, it's always been money unless it was a, uh, a benefit. And then, you know, we all did it for free. We did so many shows for free to raise money for people. And you know, that, that's something that makes me feel bad because back in the early to mid eighties, comedy was very clean. And we did every charitable organization. We did it for free and we raised a lot of money for it. When comedy started getting X-rated, the charities started not wanting to have comedy because they were worried. Right. And I said, don't worry, there are clean comedians. And they would say, promise me, promise me. Yeah. But the dirtier and dirtier comedy got, and even on TV, on cable TV, people were seeing comedy being X-rated and double X-rated and triple X-rated. And the charities weren't asking us to come anymore. And that really hurt my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you studied comedy in other countries, other cultures? I'm just curious. Do you, your big, your big collection there. Is it just American based comedy or other cultures? Yeah. Uh, I would say of the 800 plus books, it's all American except for one. Uh, the daily news once when I was doing my newspaper column, wanted me to review a book on Russian comedy. And it was very interesting because Russian comedy is like borderline anti-government, borderline, like jabbing the government a little bit, but not enough to get thrown in jail. And uh, so that's the only foreign comedy I know, except I, I did do the USO shows uh, in England and Germany and, and Wales and the Netherlands and Iceland. And they were American bases, except for one place in Wales. Uh, they didn't have a base big enough to have a theater. So it was, we did the comedy show in a pub in Wales. And when we walked in, there were five comedians and a singer. And when we walked in, the owner of the pub said, fellas, let me just tell you, uh, you've only got a few service people here. Most of the people in this audience are Welsh. They may not understand your American sense of humor. They may not understand, you know, your jokes, but just, you know, forge ahead and go ahead. Now we were supposed to do like 20 minutes a piece. And I got the guys in the parking lot because they were scared stiff. And I said, look, if it's not working for you, just cut your time, do five minutes. I'll do an hour because I do visual stuff. I do audience participation. I do stuff that people can relate to even if they don't know the language that well. And so that's what they did. They all did five minutes. I did an hour. And after it was over, the uh, owner came up to me and said, you're good, mate. You're not like an American. You're like a music hall guy. <laughs> so there's a compliment. You're not like an American. <laughs> so oh, um, I, 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 now you made me think of another story. Okay. Please, please continue. So, 
I got booked by these by an agent. Some of these agents don't care as long as uh, as long as you're booked and they make their commission, they don't care. And the agent said, "Oh, I have a client who has a party, and they saw you at a comedy club, and they want you because they think it'd be perfect." Okay, so I go and I go to the banquet, and the woman comes up. I noticed that everybody in the audience is Japanese. And the woman, who's also Japanese, comes up to me and says, oh, very nice to have you. Uh, we think you're going to be fine. She said, but one thing, I know you bring a lot of audience participation. You bring a lot of audience participants up, a lot of volunteers. Uh, do me a favor. When you pick your volunteers, only pick people from table 38. Now, table 38 was about a mile in the back. And I said, well, okay, but it's going to take them a long time to get up through the audience. Why do you only want me to pick people from 30, table 38? And she said, because they're the only ones who speak English. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, my show goodness. Business. Show business. Now, speaking of show business, um, by the way, folks, you can find Tommy Moore on Facebook. You can find him on YouTube. Uh, make sure you check him out on Facebook and YouTube. He posts great, great stories, uh, things that we don't have time to cover, amazing stories about his life on the road and, and on stage, uh, life about other comedians as well. Also, one thing I noticed that you post is you like to post encouraging things, you know, uh, life lessons from comedy. Um, what would you tell comedians today, Tommy, who have, uh, suddenly been thrust off the road and onto their couches, no gigs. What, what how, how can you encourage comics today in, in the light of what we're facing? Okay. Number one, read, read as many books as you can. Keep your mind active. Number two, this may sound funny, but watch the video of your act watch it every night so that you don't get out of practice so that you keep hearing your rhythm so you keep hearing your timing watch your video every night and write sit down and and write jokes uh, don't let this be a time when you just give up there, there's no reason to give up uh, it's all going to come back and it's all going to be fine and people are going to want to laugh more than ever uh, so you know i would say Read, write, and practice by watching your video again and again and again every night, every night. And how how important is it for you to get not only the input of uh, loved ones or friends, but you need that feedback from strangers, right, to really become better? You need that critical criticism or constructive criticism? You know, it's not even criticism. It's if they laugh or if they don't, if they don't laugh, you take the joke out. If they laugh, you keep the joke in and don't let your, your relatives or your friends make you nuts because a lot of them will laugh to be polite and that's not giving you a good gauge and others will not laugh because they're not in an audience situation where there's laughter around them. So that can depress you. Um, you know what you want to do especially if you've been in the business for a while. Uh, the middle two letters of comedy spell me. Be yourself on stage. Put yourself on stage. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from Ray Romano. Ray Romano, when he started doing Everybody Loves Raymond, went to Ed Weinberger, who was a big time producer, and he said, what's your best advice? Ed Weinberger said, do the show you want to do because eventually we all get canceled. It's a good piece of advice. Be yourself, do what you want to do on stage and the audience will understand that you're giving of yourself. And the other thing is always have fun. Don't be angry on stage. Don't be worried on stage. Don't be nervous on stage. Have fun because the root word of funny is fun and if you're having fun the audience will have fun because that's the only reason they came 
They didn't came to hear. They didn't come to hear your brilliant ideas. They didn't come to hear your your brilliant insights. They came to have fun. Perfect. Perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I get all choked up when you talk about fun. Um, in the bio we read earlier in the broadcast, it mentions that uh, you did this, you did this, you did that, and then it says, and almost a magician. You got to explain that to me. What does that mean, almost? See, in order to be a magician, you have to practice. I don't like to practice. So I do tricks that are either very easy or that don't have to work. Here, I didn't know you were going to do this. Let me reach for something here. I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to, whenever you're a magician, people always say, do a trick with a rabbit. People usually say, do a trick with a rabbit. Sometimes somebody says, do a trick with a rabbit. Do a trick with a rabbit. Thanks for pitching in. Okay, took you long enough. All right, we're going to do a trick with a rabbit. A trick with a rabbit. I learned this from a magic book. This is the rabbit. We're going to do a trick with a rabbit. I don't use a real rabbit because I don't want Peta to come after me. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to do we're going to do a trick with a rabbit. I learned from a magic book. That's where you learn magic from a magic book. Okay. Uh, they have millions of magic books, and I learned this one. This is turning a rabbit into a duck. Turning a rabbit into a for six months, I tried to turn a rabbi into a duck. <laughs> then I realized it was a misprint. Okay. It was a misprint. What are you going to do? All right. Turning a rabbit into a duck. Learned it from a magic book. Here we go. Turning a rabbit into a duck. There's the rabbit. Now it's a duck. It was a very short book. Okay. It's just a hobby. What do you want? <laughs> Hit the road, buddy. Hit the road with that act. Never did that on stage. Never did it. So I want to remind everybody, you're watching Conversations with Comedians. My name is your host, Chris Rossetti. Actually, my name is not your host. That was going to be my middle name. I'm your host, Chris Rossetti. You're watching Conversations with Comedians. And this is the amazing, the wonderful, the funny, the entertaining, the professor of fun, Mr. Tommy Moore. Or as I like to call him now, Sir Tommy Moore. Uh, and and as, as you see behind him, he has a wall of fame. And I'm going to do this once more because we're almost done, Tommy. But I want to do this once more. I want to put my picture up on your wall of fame. So, ladies and gentlemen, please indulge me. There I am. I'm covering up Pat Paulson. Forgive me, Pat Paulson. Forgive me, Pat Paulson, who also ran for president several times. Uh, there we are. There we are. I'm on Tommy's wall of fame. I have finally made it. What an honor. Now, let's get me off of there before uh, we all uh, hang up the phone. All right. There you go. Pat's back. Pat Paulson's back. Uh Looking at that wall of fame, Tommy, before we hang up the old phone here, do you have anything um, interesting to tell us about any one of those comedians? If you could, uh, not, not, you could go for hours, but if you could pick one of those oh, comedians, yeah. if you could pick one or two of those comedians on the wall, who stands out, who jumps out as being someone who impacted your life? David Brenner, where is he? He's over here. David Brenner, where are you? I don't know how to point right there. there yeah, you got him. You got him. You got him. Yeah, there he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. And I come from the same neighborhood, 15 years apart. I never met him in the neighborhood, but he was my neighborhood. His father was a vaudeville comedian, Lou, Lou Brenner. And his father taught him to have a third eye, have an eye that sees the funny in everything. And that's how you write. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. So David was about 12 years old and his, uh, his uncle passed away. And they're at the funeral, and there's his uncle laying in the box. And people are walking by saying, oh, it looks so much like John. And David said, of course it looks like John. It's John. Who's it going to look like? Aunt Sarah? And half the, <laughs> half, the, half the people laughed. And the other half of the mourners were like aghast, you know, that he said something like that. And his father grabbed him and said, there's a time and place to be funny. And David said, this wasn't the time. And the father said, no, but it was funny as heck. All right. Now, to show that we came from the same neighborhood, this is true. I had an uncle named Schnaz. That was his, uh, that was his nickname, Schnaz, because he had a big nose. Okay. Schnaz was not allowed to go to funerals because he made people laugh and you couldn't mourn when he was there. Okay. His cousin, Jimmy, passed away. Now, Jimmy was a lifelong gambler. He would gamble on anything. He would gamble on two raindrops coming down the window 
which one would land on the windowsill first, okay? So there's Jimmy laying in a box, and all the little Italian ladies are saying their prayers, and my Uncle Schnaz walks in and says, all right, everybody, hold it. Everybody, hold it. Be quiet. And everybody's quiet. And he walks over to the coffin, and he knocks on the coffin, and he says, Jimmy, there's a crap game in the alley. And he waits a few seconds, and Jimmy doesn't move. And he looks up and says, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> My goodness. So he was banned. That other guy, was, he was banned from funerals. <laughs> but he was the funniest man in the world. He was, he was incredible. He was better than any comedian. That, that reminds me of when my grandfather passed away when I was a little boy. And after the funeral, they had this massive Italian party. And I could not fathom what was going on as a little kid. And my uncle Ralph, my, my dad's uncle Ralph, who had fought in World War II, said, come on, kid, go with me. And he went and bought me an Icy, you know, down the corner. And I said, Uncle Ralph, why is everybody happy at Grandpa's funeral? I don't get it. And he said, would your grandpa want you to be sad? And I go, no. Well, that's why we're happy. That's, that's the way it is. So with that in mind, and with what you just told us, that great story you shared, what about laughter during this serious time that we're going through? I know there's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to be joyful and so forth. But how important is laughter or a good sense of humor? Uh, how important is that right now for everybody in the world? There was a comedian in the Woodstock era named Wavy Gravy. And he said, laughter is like the escape valve on a pressure cooker. If you don't laugh, you wind up with beans on the ceiling. Laughter is very important. That's why if you're on Facebook, you notice what people are posting. They're posting cartoons. They're posting cat videos. They're posting anything that makes them laugh and hopefully makes their friends laugh. You have to laugh you because the world is too nuts right now. It's too crazy. And if you think about it too much, uh, you get too depressed. Laugh and be happy. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I started about 11 years ago, the Moore Regional Hospital Clowns. And we're adult clowns who go into adult patient rooms. Uh, and we do about 1,500 patients a year. Uh, these people are sad and depressed and in pain and worried about their operation coming up, whatever. Uh, and we go in and we take their minds off their pain for five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. It's so important. I'll tell you two quick stories. Number one, first story. One is happy. One is not so happy. Uh, sad. Uh, I'll tell you the sad one first. Okay. We go into one room. And a matter of fact, the, the nurses told us not to go into the room because the guy was always asleep. But as we walked by the room, his wife, obviously, called us in and said, come in, come in, come in. Okay, there's a command performance, regardless of what the nurses said, we have to go. We went in and she shakes her husband and says, wake up, honey, wake up. There's clowns here. And he opened his eyes. And we did our little five minute thing and he didn't laugh too much. You know, he was in pain, who knows, on medication. But as we're leaving, the wife is thanking us profusely. And I said, well, we really didn't make him laugh that much. And she said, no, you don't understand. This is the first time he's opened his eyes in five days. Now, the funny story, the funny story, we went into one room and there's a woman on the phone and she says to her friend on the phone, I have to hang up now because either two clowns walked into my room or they have very good drugs in this hospital. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, laughter is vital. Absolutely vital. So the organization is called the More Regional Clowns? More regional the more regional hospital clowns. Yep. All right, let me let me type that in correctly. I'm going to add the word hospital. And can anybody look that up? Uh, like, or is it just simply the hospital brings you in? Uh, no, just the hospital brings in. And there's a there's a YouTube on it. I think it's called Hospital Clowning for Adults. 
because people hear clown, they think of little kids. Adults need to laugh just as much as anybody. And clowns can make adults laugh because they become kids again when they when they drop all of their seriousness. So yeah, I think it's called um, hospital clowning for adults. Fantastic. And you'll see. Yeah. And and Tommy, are you still performing in in the area? along with the more regional uh, hospital clowns, do you do other performances? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm st I still do banquets. I do uh, corporations. I do churches and because I'm clean. And uh, not for the last couple of months because nobody's working. Everybody's, you know, on Zoom. <laughs> but uh, it, it's all going to come back again, and we're all going to laugh again. And Just and pray for a cure, pray for health, and pray for happiness. And what, what is the best way for somebody who wants to have you perform for them, either online, uh, live, or uh, however, for money, for money people, what, what is the best way that uh, they can get a hold of you? And I'll type it in for you. No, honestly, I don't perform on live. If I can't, I, I don't perform online. Right, right, if right. If I can't do it, I don't do it. But yeah, my, my, uh, my website is profcomedy.com. That's P R O F. As in professor, comedy.com, profcomedy.com. Okay, so I just typed that in there. It's in the chat. So there you go. Uh, we've had a great time with you, Tommy. It's already been one hour. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's fun. It went by quick. And uh, I want to thank you so much for being uh, a return guest on our one year anniversary of Conversations with Comedians, for being a return guest. And uh, I showed you a book the other day. Uh, I showed you a book, uh, Jonathan Winter's uh, book. Do you have a copy of that book? That particular yeah, copy? I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jonathan fantastic. Winters. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic. Um, I've got a, I've got a um, Paul Reiser book. Do you want that? <laughs> uh, you know, I would say of, of the 800 books, there are probably 20 of them I haven't gotten to yet. And my wife is like, we've run out of closet space. We've run out of shelf space. No more. But nah, thank you. There, there, can, there can never be too many books, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again, Tommy Moore. Once again, my name is Chris Rosetti, Free to Laugh Now here in the city of San Francisco. I call myself Free to Laugh Now because I was set free from 30 years of depression. And uh, please never give up hope, folks. If you need deliverance and freedom from depression, never give up hope. If I could be set free after 30 years, your miracle could be just around the corner. You've been watching Conversations with Comedian with the amazing, wonderful, and my personal friend via the internet, Tommy Moore. It's been great, Tommy. I appreciate it. Uh, do you have any parting words for us before we go and before we hang up the old telephone here? Okay, especially in this difficult time. Remember, when one door closes, another one opens. I had a kitchen cabinet like that. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Words of wisdom, words to live by. Tommy Moore, let's both wave goodbye as we turn off the old devices. Thank you for joining us, everybody. See you next time on Conversations with Comedians. Thank you, Tommy Moore. Uh -huh. God bless you. God bless. Hi, this is Chris Rossetti in San Francisco. For Conversations with Comedians, 